So it's the way we're treating nature, isn't it? We have all these new materials. We've got plastics. We've got um, technology, we've got everything else, but we're using nature as some sort of, we just grab things from it and then we dump it. So that's really what ecofeminism is about. As I said, I don't have an animus as such about the individual men in my life, more to do with culture. And this is, I believe, one of the first collections of eco, ecofeminism put worldwide, so much so that um, it's only now being taken up. And that's fine, it's been reissued. Now, this is the very same, all, almost the same as when it came out first in 1987. And in view of the state of the country, I thought I'd read when I wrote on the ship of state in 1980. This, is, uh, this hasn't been changed in 1987. The ship of state. The ship of state, she was a frozen image, grown out of bloodshed, murder, adage. Inward gazing brought her short hysteria and banished her writers to outer Siberia. Hot soul, mind, and spirit for foreign exchange, swallowed ideas till they grew a mange. Advertisement, the sugar stick of seduction, ground her on the rock of destruction. The shores polluted, the rivers sinking, rotten, show how a less than modern state is begotten. The air is full of fumes from motor cars, smoke of heating up of little czars. The sea cogitates, warning starfish, to assume the form of anguish. So that's the culture we're in, where everything... I've cut it down by quite a lot. Um, and it's from the book Gallows, which came out um, last, the end of last year, and it's called The Free Travel. And I hope that um, I'm ordering If anybody at the back cannot hear, please click, cry out and say so. He was the only Swiss citizen ever known to come to Ireland as an asylum seeker, and what's more, he was successful. He was granted the status of political refugee he never ceased to be grateful for it. Of course, it was a long time ago, the early 1960s, and in those days the Irish were actually proud of the succour the state provided for harassed and persecuted strangers. By 2002, he had become markedly elderly, older in appearance than his calendar years, and a rough little fellow with wire spectacles, grey goatee beard, and Tyrolean hat with a cord for a hat band. In the cord, he wore a cock's tail feather, curly and fawny and half an inch too long. He was known amongst his neighbours in County Mayo as Mr Higgins, Cuckle Higgins, or even Charlie, which was odd for a man with such a strong Teutonic accent, but rather more convenient for day-to-day -day intercourse than his birth name, Carl Huygen, which he kept for official purposes. Now and again, he found the chance to insist upon what he called proper and historical nomenclature. Oh, we did, he would pronounce with careful attention to the shapes of the vowels and consonants. And that is how it was, and if all of us spoke our beautiful Irish as fluent as were our forebears, that is how it would be. Forebears, but of course. In the 17th century, during the Thirty Years' War, there had been, he would explain, a mercenary captain called Owen, or was it Eamon? Or Piggy, a male man in point of fact, cut off from the main body of the Emperor's army in a misfortunate battle. He blundered through the winter into a deep alpine valley and never came out of it. <laughs> the war had devoured so many of the men of the valley that when a hard pressed young widow woman stumbled over this blood bolted dead or half dead in the snow behind her barn, she reacted with immediate practicality. She fed him, healed his wounds, bedded him, and married him. Nor did his descendants forget their progenitor, which is why, more than three centuries later, Herr Huygen chose Ireland and Mayo in Ireland as his place of political refuge, when he was, as he would explain, a young and perhaps overzealous financial journalist with unexpected difficulties, a difficulties which most certainly were political, as he constantly reiterated, by no means some dodgy business to the Zurich 